everybody and it's been a while since we've made a video and uh, we've been wanting to make a video for several months now but um, we've just been busy and honestly the break has been good for us um, for making videos and, but as many of you will be aware there was a news story that came out this past week that was very disturbing and we've just felt a need to talk about it and share our voice and um, make sure that the story doesn't just die that it gets um, you know the coverage that it deserves yeah and I think this story in particular it's kind of gotten a lot of attention lately worldwide and nationally so it's something that for those of you who are watching if you're not familiar with the story we're going to talk about um, it's something that every active Jehovah's Witness should know about. It's a story that everyone should know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it came out uh, in my, I got it in my Google alerts on Saturday morning, I believe. Uh, a story about a couple in Michigan, called, uh, their names are Lauren and Dan Stewart. And they had two children, uh, two adult children. And um, it there was a murder-suicide where the police found four bodies and then as the story progressed we find out that it was actually Lauren a 45 year old woman and former Jehovah's Witness who murdered her family and then killed herself and um, where, the reason why it came across our Google Alerts is because one of the neighbors pointed out that uh, they seemed like a nice family. They had, you know, uh, just, it's a calm, quiet neighborhood. And, uh, but that she had um, tried to recruit them into her religion as one of Jehovah's Witnesses a few years before. And so that's why it came across my Google Alert, because they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And immediately when I first saw, read the story, I mean, it's shocking to read a story about a murder-suicide to begin with, but that they were former Jehovah's Witnesses. And so that instantly, the first thing that I thought of, and basically it became it has become and is becoming more and more confirmed that they couldn't or she couldn't handle being shunned by her family and former friends and that this has had taken a toll on her mental health on her husband's mental health and um, as a result one more tragedy you know to add to the thousands and we know there are thousands of tragedies within this organization, not to mention the blood issue, not to mention the child sexual abuse, but suicides. That there is a high suicide rate among ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. And it's something that has not gained the spotlight that it deserves. Um, well, me mental health has often been overlooked in this country. Um, well, it's, it's notoriously been overlooked in this country. And there's so much that we know now that we didn't know 50 years ago about mental health. And the thing I think people are really realizing now is how important your mental health is because it affects every part of your life, including your decision making and the quality of your life, you know, your happiness level. And so there's there's so many things that go into that and people who are devoting their lives to the study of mental health, you know, doctors and psychologists, psychiatrists, they still don't know really every anything about. I mean, they ha they have knowledge. They don't know everything there is to know. So it just makes me think that the Jehovah's Witness elders who are dealing with the members of the congregation who are indeed having some troubles mentally, having troubles adapting to the world around, having coping 
troubles, suffering from depression or anxiety. Um, the elders don't have the kind of training or knowledge or experience to be able to properly counsel anyone about these things. So I think that it's just, it's a cycle that's been going and going and with the attention of this national story, um, it's kind of come to a head and it's good. I mean, it's a, it's a tragic story, but someone has finally woken up and taken note and it doesn't seem like it's just gonna be washed away. It doesn't seem that way. And thank you to Joyce Taylor for your bravery. She was friends of the family and herself a former Jehovah's Witness, although she left some 30 years ago. Uh, she bravely went into that kingdom hall that that family had attended on Sunday and said that she just needed a minute of their time. And instead of, you know, honoring, <laughs> they knew why she was there. I think they knew why she was there because this was, a, a, you know, a smallish town mm -hmm. and something this tragic. But it seemed like people were unfazed by the story, but the elders just surrounded her like a wall to try to prevent her from saying what she came there to say. And uh, we'll just play the video right now and then before we'll talk. Before we play the video, I think the other thing that's important to notice is that the elders who try and stop this they do not hear a word she's saying. Nope. You're talking about the life of someone who was a member of your congregation who was brutally killed and committed suicide. So you're, you're saying something that anyone with a heart, anyone with any kind of caring personality would say to themselves, I, I knew that person. I mean, you might not want your meeting to be interrupted, but to not even hear what this person is saying, to not even acknowledge that someone you know, a fellow brother and a fellow sister and their children, died very tragically, just days before, and you can't even acknowledge it. Now that says to me that there is a major problem in a lack of humanity. You know, it, even when you're in the congregation, as a member of the congregation, there's been many instances that the lack of compassion of the brothers in charge is why they've left. And we see that in, I mean, I don't want to get too far into other instances, but it happens in so many other instances where people are dealt with a lack of compassion, lack of caring, lack of, lack of sympathy or empathy. Um, the, the elders just aren't qualified, not necessarily even as doctors or therapists or counselors, but even as human beings in most cases. Right, so let's just play the video and we'll talk about that, but I mean we have a lot more to say about this and you know it's such a tragic story, but let's go ahead and just watch the video. Excuse me everyone, my name is Joyce Taylor, please excuse the intrusion, I'll only be a moment. No, you cannot touch me, you cannot touch me. Two Excuse days me. ago. Two days ago. Go away for a minute. No, we may have Two to days ago. Excuse you can call the police. Please have, do. Call. Two have, days ago, Dan and Lois Stewart died. Four people died as a result of your shunning process. Can we go in the back and talk? No. Five years ago, all of you pulled your support from this small family. From this small family. Please get down. And you all do not touch me. Do not touch me. Please get down. The only support they ever had was you people. And you turned, your, you turned them away and you shunned them. For what? Because they wanted to raise their children and they saw fit. Jesus said, the police are on the way. The that you did this to the least of mine. You did it to me. Let that sink in. Do any of you realize just how fragile the human psyche is? I hope in your prayers today. You Please will find that in your heart, ask forgiveness for, for what you guys did. 
Yeah. This is terrible. No, we need to be careful. Be careful getting there. Do not touch me. Thank you, everyone. That's quite unusual. Well, protected First Amendment. Yeah. I mean, technically, she did nothing illegal. Me and Laura Stewart are dead. There are two children that are dead. They are dead. Thank you. Thank you. Man, this is going to be interesting in my essay. Sorry about the interruption. Sorry for the interruption. It was just an interruption. Yep. The other thing I thought that was, and it's a tactic and a ploy that the Jehovah's Witnesses use every single time somebody steps up and says something out loud that they don't want other people to hear. Let's go in the back room. Let's go outside and talk about this. Not in front of everyone, because they do not want the members of the congregation to know any of these things. They don't want the members of the congregation to know the details about the shunning and what, how it may have driven this person to a deep depression and, and all the things that came along with that. They don't want people to know. They don't want people to feel guilty for shunning the other people. So the, it's like if, if the members of the congregation made themselves fully aware of how bad this person felt after being shunned, they would then accept, have to accept some of the guilt for what happened. If they're a member of the congregation and they indeed shunned that person, or even if it was just a matter of seeing them in the store and walking the other way. You contributed to this. Mm -hmm. And she's, you know, one of the things that she said, and obviously she was feeling very passionate and, you know, upset that her friends were dead, but she said that they pulled the trigger. And, I mean, metaphorically, yeah. I said this before. I said this in our video about the summer convention a couple of years ago when the, this, uh, the shunning video came out where the girl tried to call her mom and her mom didn't pick up. And I said back then, if that person was on the verge of committing suicide, and that's the last phone call she made, then her mother, I believe, was blood guilty. Yeah, because that was an intentional act of not taking the phone call. And that's the hypocrisy that is so apparent that the elders and the organization will tell you if you do not engage in the ministry work, you can be blood guilty. You are you, blood guilty, because according to you, Anthony Morris. Because you did not do what you were supposed to do to help save others. And yet, this is a person in your own congregation who was at this point because the members of the congregation had no Christian love for their brother and sister. Well, all the details have not come out, but I speculate that the hardest part was that their families were shunning them. Um, that has been alluded to by uh, Joyce in other interviews that I've heard her on recently. Um, and obviously more details will surface about that. Um, but to, you know, we were talking about this a little before we started filming. This is a really hard subject to talk about um, because it's, you know, it's just very emotional and, you know, we've been living through our own shunning for over a year and a half now. But going back 12 years ago when I first made the final decision for myself that I didn't believe in this, that I didn't want to be a witness, I went through deep depression for fear that I was going to lose my family. Um, losing my friends and my social structure, having been a witness, um, 
that was bad enough, but knowing that I was going to lose my family was debilitating. Um, I went through severe depression over it, and but I finally had to come to terms with the fact that whether they were going to shun me or not shun me, this is what I had to do for my own mental health. I had to get out of this controlling organization. And, um, you know, it. thankfully, you know, I had Mike, and we had each other, and, you know, I wasn't going through it alone. Um, and my family, I didn't get shunned all at once, you know, it was gradual shunning. It was a gradual emotional isolation away from my family. And as the years went along, uh, we just were sort of in this holding pattern of a, you know, very shallow relationship. Mm -hmm. How's the weather relationship? How's the weather? Um, that was a safe topic for conversation. So when the final, you know, act of telling me they weren't going to talk to me ever again happened, um, not that I was prepared for it because you can never be prepared for that rejection from the people who are supposed to love you the most. But um, it wasn't as traumatic, I would guess, as losing all of that social structure and family relationships at, at all at once. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the basis to this video though is that the shunning policy, the disfellowshipping policy has far-reaching effects. Mm -hmm. Far-reaching effects that the men that actually sit down and make the decision cannot possibly foresee the outcome. No one could, but they, made, they didn't make themselves available to provide the counsel and shepherding that they're supposed to. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, leaving the organization leaves a person with a lot of questions, a lot of ch things change in their life. It's really topsy-turvy emotionally. Um, sometimes, you know, depression and other things are, are what, that's what your life is at that time. But there's ways out of it. There are ways to, um, to speak with people, uh, counselors, professionals, grief counselors. Mm -hmm. um, there are psychiatrists and psychologists who have dealt with people who are and were Jehovah's Witnesses, who are experienced with dealing with people who are in high control groups. So it it's, it's, is something that exists, but there are places to go to get real help and it's not something that a lot of times the organization or the brothers would ever encourage one of the members of the congregation to do so it's just it's so serious with everything that's happening there are help options out there for people and you know we, I don't know the circumstances of this particular case but the help is there and witnesses are oftentimes discouraged from going, mm -hmm. which in a way, to me, if something happens and a person was discouraged from going to a worldly counselor or seeking a help from a worldly doctor, then the person who discouraged it is blood guilty as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... it. I just want to go back to what we were talking about, about the lack of compassion. Um, part of being raised in or being a part of a high control group um, is that your emotions have been controlled and you've been told not to mourn for, not to mourn inordinately about those who have passed um, because everything is because Jehovah because Jehovah is going to fix it not to mourn inordinately about tragedies that happen in the news such as just last week just up the road from us mm -hmm. 
17 people, mostly children, were shot to death at Parkland, at, in Parkland. Marjorie Douglas Stone. At Mar yeah. yeah, at the high school. It's not too far from us. But as witnesses, turn it off. This is a conversation starter for your door-to-door -door ministry. Did you hear about the tragedy? But Jehovah, see, no fellow feeling. If someone suffered a divorce, oh, but if they had Jehovah. The Bible tells of a time where there's going to be everyone who's married is going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. But that goes to, all of that kind of goes to the other point that the Jehovah's Witnesses are not living their life right now. Mm -hmm. They're living for a future day. Everything is put on hold. Everything is stopped in its tracks in order for you to pursue or to build up treasure in heaven for this future time. And the problem is that that time isn't coming, hasn't come. But for those who believe that it is still coming, they're in a situation that's stuck sometimes. Because what if, let's just say, there, and there have been cases of this, you were sexually assaulted by a member of the congregation and you felt you had to leave that congregation because you could no longer sit across the aisle from your abuser. And when it was made public, perhaps you were even disfellowshipped or forced to make a choice whether to stay in and, and deal with this or to set yourself free. So if anything bad happens to you, and it might have nothing to do with necessarily any choices that you made, but you're not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So this is what happens when you're not serving Jehovah, when you're not doing things Jehovah's way, or if you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You weren't focused on kingdom interests, and this is what happened to you. So you're never living, you're never living for now, you're never living in the present moment, you're always living for something in the future because right now everything is terrible, but you're not supposed to feel bad about it. You're not supposed to grieve the terrible things that happen in the world, the terrible things that happen to other people. You're not supposed to join charities and fundraisers and things that help your fellow man out. But Jehovah, he's the one that's going to fix it, so you don't waste your time fixing it. Just spend your hours, donate all your free time, and by the way, your money, which now we're setting up a PayPal account, or whatever their version is of it, so they automatically take your money out now. You don't even have to think about it. Direct deposit for Jehovah. Mm-hmm. So you're in this holding pattern of turning off your feelings about what's happening in the world to people around you, you, have, you don't have the fellow feeling. It's a numbness towards other people. And when you leave the organization and you wake up, you start getting your humanity back that you never had if you were raised in it. If, if you allow yourself to have relationships with fellow humans. Mm -hmm. Now there's people who have left who still believed maybe that the Jehovah's Witness organization had the truth. They believed that they themselves weren't good enough, didn't deserve it, were gonna die at Armageddon, and they still held back from every other thing in the world and kept themselves isolated. Mm -hmm. So like, you've gotta kind of accept other humans into your life and build those relationships and yes yes mm -hmm. build your humanity see that people are for the most part pretty good yeah um, and it does seem like that that might be the case slightly that maybe she still believed that this was the truth um, I don't know for sure I've, I've heard some mixed things about that but um, Mike came across a very interesting video that we're going to share a clip. Uh, maybe you can set it up. Yeah, so as many of you know, um, I watch all of the meetings 
uh, every week. I watch the weekend meetings, public talk, watchtower study. So this, uh, this is actually a clip that comes from the watchtower study, just from this past weekend. So I think that was February 17th. Um, and it's, the whole watchtower study was about indoctrinating your children. And uh, this clip speaks for itself. How about uh, Brother Yule? And this thought of um, being persuaded to believe, meaning being convinced, made me think of, you know, there's a number of tr truths of which we are convinced sometimes that we may not remember the actual knowledge that proves it. We might have to go back and look it up if we want to explain it to somebody else. But the fact that we took in the knowledge then we're convinced of that truth, the convincing stays, even if the knowledge might leave our heads and we have to look it up later, but the convincing is still there. Good point. Okay, so that was a comment in one of the paragraphs in the Watchtower study from one of the brothers in the congregation. And we can clearly see that what he's describing is brainwashing. brainwashing. So, you may not know why you believe something or where the evidence for that is. But you still feel it inside. You still know the answer. Right. That it doesn't leave you. Um, well, you know, when you are raised with something, um, very, very powerful beliefs that shaped your whole world view it's hard to shake those beliefs mm -hmm. um in fact i just got an email yesterday from somebody who said how i've been out for one year but i'm finding it hard to get rid of the beliefs even though they don't believe in it anymore it's still in some way controlling them and I said, just give it time and keep doing your research, read some books, read Stephen Hassan's book, Escaping Cold Mind Control. Yeah. I mean, I, I gave a, a bunch of recommendations, but it, that just takes time. I think that is also something, along with the indoctrination thing, that the Jehovah's Witnesses maybe have a more difficult time with than people of other faiths, of other high control groups that escape, is that we've been conditioned to not do research in outside publications, to not trust the information we find in research and outside publications. So even like, for example, even after I did not believe it, I no longer believed that the Jehovah's Witnesses had the truth because I had found out that the year 607 was wrong. I still did not do any further investigation into why the religion itself is wrong and false and backed by so much hypocrisy is because of those teachings that I had when I was a child of how to, you know, I still was thinking there's apostate stuff out there that you shouldn't listen to, even though I didn't believe it. So the brainwashing, the indoctrination, uh, it is absolutely so powerful that you may not even realize how affected you are by the way you were taught to think. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are masters of indoctrination mm -hmm. and that's mind control. So, you know, one of the things that Joyce talked about and um, I heard her on The Fateful Slave is, and Joyce, by the way, not only was she her friend, and former Jehovah's Witness, but also went to school after she left the organization to become a social worker and then she got her degree in psychiatric social work. So, I mean, she's a good resource basically for this story and I'm very sorry for her loss. I mean, it's it's terrible, but I mean, she she said it that Lauren did not know how to function in society and we get that it I did not know how to function in society when I first left it may have looked like I did just because you fake it till you make it kind of thing but I felt so lost 
and didn't trust people, had a really hard time making friends. Um, it, and it wasn't so much just making friends, but trusting that they weren't bad to the core <laughs> because they weren't witnesses. Right, and not only that, but it's the constant, I, I don't want to say guilt, but it is guilt in a way that, you know, it'll be Thursday night, you'll be home from work, you'll be like, I would normally be at the meeting right now. Saturday morning comes along, Sunday morning comes along, the memorial comes along, and you don't believe it, but you still think about those times and those dates, and you're like, well, I'm not going, but early on, it makes you feel some kind of way, you know? It's not so easy just to flip a switch that's been flipped the opposite direction in many cases since you were born. Right. Um, I, I was speaking to um, a psychologist, a psychologist who is one of my best friends tonight, and I, I before we started filming this, I just said, I, can I just pick your brain and talk to you? very briefly, um, you know, about this story, and, um, I mean, she's been a great support structure for me for the past couple of years, but one of the things that she, some of the things that she was saying is about in this kind of situation, um, it's lost of, loss of your attachment bonds, loss of all your traditions, it's isolation, it's it's sort of like um, while well, she said it was like being orphaned um, to to be shunned in this manner um, that it's repeated rejection because every time you send a text and it's not answered or you s try to call and it's not answered or you send an email and it's not answered that's a continual form of rejection and it's, you know, basically you have to, you're forming a new identity because you've lost your entire identity. You've lost all your, like, your traditions. Even though as witnesses I say we had no traditions, but we had fam certain family traditions. Things that you could count on as a family of getting together, right. you know, for a meal or, you know, for different occasions. That I'm sorry to interject, but that's the one thing I was just going to say as you were reading that. I was thinking, as a Jehovah's Witness, all of your traditions are based in the religion. Mm -hmm. So when you leave the religion, you leave all of, not only the religion, your family for traditions, and your family. So when you come out on the other side of that, you literally have nothing. Which is why we've talked about it before. We have to make our own traditions. Start from scratch. Um, it's really hard for some people to do that. Because, like for example, um, we put up Christmas lights or whatever. And a Christmas tree. Is it because we believe Jesus is a baby born in a manger? No, it's none of those things. And it took us years to even go that far. But the idea was... You know, we've been away from the organization for so long. Let's try and start making some of our own family traditions. Mm -hmm. Because it's important to have tight bonds with the people that you love and the people that you rely on and the people that you're close with. And as a Jehovah's Witness, you're always taught that the people in the congregation, these are the people you can rely on till the end. Your life may depend on them, and their life may depend on you at some point in time. Mm -hmm. So these are the people you can trust more than anyone in the world. And if you get caught smoking a cigarette, or if you doubt a belief, or if you question something a brother says, or if you are young and have sex with your girlfriend, you could lose everything in your life. Mm -hmm. And it's not... It's not Christian, it's not loving, it's hypocritical, mm -hmm. and it's the opposite of what you're told as a member. You're told love, care, compassion. It's there for you. We're here for you. And the minute something goes against a rule, and sometimes with no compassion, the elders make these judgments, and we've heard 
audio tapes of numerous judicial committees. So we say this having knowledge of this. Mm -hmm. The elders, in many cases, have no compassion. They are company men who follow the rules. It's almost as if there's a quota or a bonus to disfellowship people. So it just seems... It's cold and impersonal. These judicial seem, meetings are cold and impersonal. And they're unfair. Unfair. And they leave a person with an empty feeling that no one has heard their side. No one has heard their voice. They were dismissed without any acknowledgement of the concerns that they brought to the table. And that also leaves you, now you're out of the organization, you feel for a good reason, no one has listened to you, no one has heard any of your concerns or complaints, they dismiss you out of hand and kick you out and take your family and your traditions away from you, and that's it. Yeah. They may as well put you in a rocket and launch you into outer space. Yeah. Right. So, one of the things that Dr. Lawson told me is that for some people, religion is actually beneficial to them because um, having a religious st structure in their life can um, give them the social support, even if it's <laughs> very conditional social support. Mm -hmm but gives them routines and structures that you can count on. Um, and this is all in this, the vein of someone uh, preventing someone from committing suicide. That having those social structures, having those routines in place, having um, that someone that you, you know that you're going to see and that can support you when you go to church or to meetings. Um, what else did she say? But that when that is all stripped away from you all at once, that, you know, that that, that would account for a high suicide rate among these high control groups that practice shunning. So, you know, this is obviously not the end of the story, and, but it just shook me especially um, I think because I had those suicidal thoughts um, for years and no, even years before I even left the organization knowing that if I left that first there was the fear of well what if this is the truth and then I'm going to be destroyed at Armageddon I think that's one everyone thinks about too yeah. mm -hmm. Even though I had great cause to not believe it was the truth, um, but then coming to terms with that, that no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to be destroyed at Armageddon mm -hmm. because that's not real. That is a myth. But, um, but then being destroyed in a different sense of being dead to people who are your family that have known you your whole life and that are supposed to love you. I, I, I want to bring up one other thing that you just reminded me of and I didn't want to forget it because I think it's important is that if you leave the Jehovah's Witnesses and you believed and you were a believer especially if you were born in like we were one of the other things that can be and probably will be and should be depressing is the realization of your own mortality and you know we see tragedies like this happen a lot in our daily lives unfortunately and it is the natural thing to think about your own mortality your own life and you know when you leave like in I'm gonna speak just for myself leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses organization I no longer have any religious beliefs. I don't have a belief in an afterlife. So, accepting that, and for me, believing that, it makes me have a greater appreciation for every single moment of every single day and to feel fortunate and lucky to be here right now.
to be here, to be anywhere, you know, it is like a one in a trillion chance that I'm even alive. So, you know, it's appreciation and gratitude for the little things. But as Jehovah's Witnesses, that is not something that will come naturally. It's not something that will be easy because it goes against everything we've ever been taught. That's true. <laughs> Coming to terms with your mortality once you leave is, uh, you know, I, I've tried explaining this to people because I said, you know, to my non-witness friends, you know, you know, logically, you know, even though you maybe never thought deeply about it, that everything is born and everything dies. So, logically, you, you knew you were going to die. I said, I really believed I was never going to die because I was told I was never going to die. I was told I was never going to graduate from high school because this world was going to be coming to an end before that would become a possibility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that... <laughs> well, that's something that I think about because um, in listening to the meetings, there's all these talks in Watchtowers aimed toward young people. And you hear the comments that they make during the meetings. And they're making the comments like we would have made in 1982 when we we're little kids at the meeting, thinking, we're not going to die. The system is going to come before we become adults or even are able to drive a car. And they are being taught the same things we were taught, even though so much has changed. And they are going to wake up to a very harsh reality at some point in the future. Because the same cycle of words that the organization is spinning is coming back around again. And it's just, they're empty words. It's all empty words. It's a tornado of empty words coming at you. So I, I said it before and I'll say it again that uh, the book that really helped me in my waking up process to realize I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I don't know why. I made a rhyme. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was this little gem. Draw close to Jehovah. Which now I have this book back in my life as a result of a box being delivered, a few boxes of like, literature being delivered to us we, by an ex-witness. Friends of ours have donated to our cause <laughs> a vast library of Jehovah's Witness literature. Mm -hmm. We now are in possession of the bound volumes going back to 1951. Yeah. All of them, I think. And all the indexes and lots of old weird video cassette movies that I don't think I've seen, like two or three of them. Uh, it, yeah. Some old, cla a lot of old magazines, like individual magazines, a lot of brochures, uh, a lot of those books, those 192 page books, the hardcover and the softcover ones. So. So we sort of got off of what we were talking about, the serious topic, but. I am going to put some links um, below to some articles that my psychologist friend sent to me about the effects of isolation. And it talks about all different kinds of isolation, but it does talk about within groups and religious groups. So I think that this is really important and we will talk about this more, I'm sure, as time goes on. So this story of the murder-suicide that we're seeing right now, this current story, is not the only murder-suicide family annihilator that we've seen from Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not even the second. It's the third since 2001. In 2001, a Jehovah's Witness man in Oregon killed his wife, his three children, and himself. In 2014, a Jehovah's Witness man killed himself, <laughs> killed his children, killed his wife, and killed himself in South Carolina. So this is 
I don't want to say this is an emerging pattern we're seeing, but this has happened before. And I would like to think that when these things happen, especially in a close-knit organization like the Jehovah's Witnesses, that someone would take a look at this, someone would try and learn from it, someone would try and prevent this from happening again. It's twisted thinking, and, and, and you know, you said you, you wanted to end, you know, it's, it's, a serious, it's a serious topic, it's a serious video, but I think the idea of love and compassion are serious topics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that to Jehovah's Witnesses, love and compassion come second to obedience and um, intolerance, I guess. It, they're not tolerant of other people. They're always told to be obedient to the organization. They're really, they're really fighting an uphill battle when love and compassion are the traits that sh true Christians should show. You know, and I just, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this video, if you're a current Jehovah's Witness and somehow you came across our video and maybe you've disagreed with a lot of what we've said, um, I really, challenge you to do research outside of what your organization has provided as to what is the actual scriptural basis for shunning and is it really a Bible teaching because um, you know there have been much more educated Bible scholars than have ever come out of the Watchtower Society. Educated. <laughs> who would disagree with Jehovah's Witness teaching that it is a biblical teaching. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, you know, I offer that to you that if you believe that this is a scriptural teaching, um, do a little more research because I think you'll be surprised at what you might find. And I want to issue a challenge to Jehovah's Witnesses who find this video. If you know someone who's disfellowshipped, disassociated, who was a friend of yours, someone you knew, I challenge you to just send them a text, send them an email, give them a quick phone call. You may not want to engage in discussions, but let them know that you care about them as a human being, that all the years you spent with them door to door in the ministry and developing friendships with those people wasn't for nothing because you don't know what's going on in people's lives unless you ask, unless you insert yourself, unless you become a part of it. And dare I say, none of you who see this, who are Jehovah's Witnesses, would want to get the news that someone you are friends with has committed suicide or has been murdered. And maybe they were really upset about the situation, and that's how you left it. You have an opportunity today, right now, to stop what you're doing and just reach out. Because that's the human thing to do. It's, the, it's also the Christian thing to do, you know, but beside the point, it's a human thing to do. And, and you know that I'm right. That's the thing. You know that I am right when I say that. So follow your gut. These are human beings that we're talking about. They're not shadows on a wall. Uh, so much more I feel like I could say about this topic. Um, I just, but we're going to leave it there. And um, this is a really sad, sad situation. But um, anyways, hopefully we'll be coming back to you with more videos soon. Um, we, we have topics just piling up that we want to talk about. And um, thank you to the individuals that have sent us literature. It's kind of 
ironic now that we're building a watchtower library <laughs> that cannot be destroyed through the click of fingertips on JW.org. Oh, I was telling Robin when we got the box, a 1968 watchtower talking about 1975, to have that in hard copy in your hand is, do do now? is awesome. I mean, hey, they have everything really only going back to two, 2000, 2000. Mm -hmm. on the JW library. Um, which is ridiculous because they have the capacity to have all their literature available. Missing 116 years of history if it only goes back to 2000. But they don't want people knowing their history. They're, they don't want their people knowing their history. Mm -hmm. um, because that's old light, right? Well, thank you, Deb. I received this book and I tried to send you an email, but it bounced back. But I want to thank you for sending um, Visions of Glory by a History and Memory of Jehovah's Witnesses by Barbara Rizzuti Harrison. I read this in about a day and a half. It was so fascinating. And this book was written in 1978. She was a former witness who spent three years in Bethel and she left in the mid, mid to late 50s she left and her story was just fascinating and it's like you realize when you're reading this even though this was written in 1978 a lot has changed but not much has actually mm -hmm. changed yeah. <laughs> within the organization and just the, the the mental duress that she went through being a witness so uh, anyways we're going to leave it there. Thank you for watching. And, um, you know, just, I don't even know what to say about this story. We're, you know, hopefully more information will surface and we'll understand more of why this happened. But it's pretty tragic. In the meantime, it should be a wake-up call for us to appreciate one another while we're here. You know? Absolutely. So. That's it.